Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the host of the conference, Michael Hennessy. Thank you. So I'm hoping actually you, you came to listen and, uh, and not for the iPad draw. Yeah, don't draw now. Wait till later. Okay, I'll wait say. till Val and Carol are over. Um, that's, uh, that's not a bad idea. Um, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so about, uh, what was it, last September? It was a year ago here at this conference when we first started talking about the, Oh, you mean which one? Which the IIC? Uh, October. October. Okay. Last, last October uh, in Ottawa at the uh, IIC, um, Telefilm and the CMF, with, with support from the CRTC, but this has really been uh, very much a, a Telefilm CMF exercise, uh, started to ask the question, um, where is all the good Canadian content? We're making brilliant Canadian content People around the world seem to know more about our Canadian content than they do at, at home. And I think that was, that was we, we, we heard that at the Canadian Screen Awards as, as well. Um, so, you know, the issue really came about as to, you know, how do you know as a consumer what's Canadian? How do you know what's good? How do you know what's really scoring well? How do you know what's scoring in other countries? How do you discover that? How do you access old programs? How do you clear the rates? How, how, uh, how do you... Uh, uh, restore things. And, and Carol and uh, Valerie um, got a whole project going that was very much about uh, promotion and discoverability and access and um, called out on a lot of people to the industry, well, let's come up with ideas collectively as to how to make this happen. So I just wanted, I, I thought it would be really good before we get into uh, some of the other people on, on a working group we've got going. Um, to hear from uh, Carole and, and uh, Valerie, who I don't have to introduce them, do I? I mean, uh, Carole Bergon, head of Telefilm, Valerie Caton, uh, head of the Canadian Media Fund. I mean, they're like gods to us in the Producers uh, <laughs> Association. There may be, Goddess, there may be, Goddess, there may be <laughs> other people that you know complain about your works, but we love you. Um, <laughs> just keep the money coming. Uh, so. Um, why don't, uh, Carol, did you want to did you want to start and just let people know sort of what our thinking was really about and you know yeah. what you're thinking but of you today? But you almost said everything I, I was planning saying. So. so are we done now? Then? <laughs> uh, no, it sounded very much from the uh, secretary to James Moore that you have at least a little more time. Okay. <laughs> Now, uh, effectively, the, the premises about uh, talking about uh, promotion was really that uh, we do have talent, and I think that uh, recent years were, uh, were really about talent. We had uh, Oscars, you mentioned it this morning, three selections three years in a row at the Oscars. We had also uh, two films in competition in Berlin. But the question we, we ask ourselves, how do we leverage that international success at home? Uh, as you mentioned, il y a quelques mois, nous étions réunis à Ottawa, ici, et uh, pour le lancement du tout premier symposium sur la promotion du cinéma et de la télévision canadien. With, with the vital support and partnership of the CRTC, Canada Media Fund, as well as the generous sponsorship of Cineplex and E1, we began a very important conversation on how to boost the profile of our industry in a unified and focused way. The, the highlights of the symposium, the way I recall it, was, uh, were built on the success of our Canadian films and television programs, greater use of social media to engage Canadians, and most of all, develop a strategy to invigorate the Canadian brand in the global marketplace, so to stimulate the demand, increase the visibility, and reach out to audiences. And I think that we had a very good example of what uh, we can do when we work together. Uh, the Canadian Screen Awards was, was a good example. I think that most of you were, or some of you were there on Sunday night, and the national media coverage, the newly minted Canadian Screen Awards, definitely stake their place as the replacement for the Genies and the Geminis. But most importantly, the CBC telecast 
drew an average BBM audience of 756,000 viewers, and the broadcast event reached a total of 2.9 million on all platforms. So I think we can speak about, we can talk about success. And the success of the inaugural Canadian Screen Awards also under, underlines uh, another key point. Canadian films love Canadian television. In fact, Canadians report in audience research that television is the platform where they watch films more frequently. 44% of Canadians watch films on TV once a week, or 52 films a year. And I will remind you that they go only three times to the theaters. 75% of Canadians will see the film on television, and they will want to see those films uh, thanks to the publicity that they see on television. La télévision se classe au deuxième rang après le bouche à oreille. So of course, the recent launches of new distribution platforms are adding to, in, to the entertainment experience of Canadians by making access to content easier and easier. Moving forward, we need to continue to work together to maximize the impact of our investments in Canadian content through a branding campaign that will, rise, that will raise the profile of our films and TV programs a campaign that will ensure that our productions continue to punch above their weight on the global stage. I was very glad that Michael Annecy and Barbara Williams have agreed to lead a working group on how to build a plan on promotion and branding. And on this, I will leave the microphone to Valerie, who will speak about some ideas on the dig digitalization and access. Thanks, Carol. And I think you know we both want to thank the CRTC for their leadership in the symposium. To my knowledge, it was historic that the CRTC and the two major funding agencies got together to focus on this kind of dialogue. So it was about a year ago, I think, when we um, talked here at this conference about the whole concept of promotion and content and the Watch Canada proposal. Since that time, obviously, a lot has happened in the industry. We now have uh, Quebecor has launched their new service, the, if you like, I know Serge will come and contradict me, but kind of the Netflix in the Quebec market, the Starlight Channel, uh, you've heard and, and seen many, many, many pieces of information about it and its application is before the CRTC. So it seems that there's a lot of discussion and talk about promotion and access to the content. In addition to the IIAC, just a couple of quick things. Uh, Telefilm and the CMF and 20 other wonderful partners also uh, did a couple of screening on the promotion side events at the Calgary International Film Festival and the Women's Festival in St. John's, Newfoundland last year, which historically brought the highest number of public participation to that screening and political participation at the political and municipal level. So as we heard this today at lunch, um, we seem to be in pretty good shape at the federal level and of course a broad base of political support for everything that you do and our content making in this country is also important. And we also did the country of honor, uh, Canada was the country of honor at MIP and again Telefilm, CMF and in partnership with Read Me Dem and many partners there, we had over 12,000 people focus on Canada in that international market. So in terms of the old Watch Canada concept that we talked about, you remember this ecosystem chart was put up last year. Clearly, we talked about that as the potential for a portal or a platform. So after we did the symposium in Ottawa, we determined we better do some current research on if that's still the best way to go. And we just received that research from Authentic, and Claude Gallopo is on this panel. I think he'll talk about it a bit. But essentially, we have not digested it yet. We just got it on Friday, I think it yeah. was. So Carol and I have spoken about it briefly, but it appears that a standalone portal is not the best way to approach this, that there are many other options that we're going to consider uh, in partnership with several others. One of the biggest obstacles identified, however, is the content itself. So one of the investigations that we're going to pursue is taking a look at how we can find the money to take 1,000 titles of premium Canadian content in feature film, television, and digital media and find a way to get the rights cleared and that content digitized so that we can make it as an offering in the market 
to our own VOD, SVOD services, or others around the world. We don't have the answers to that yet. It's just a recommendation in the report, so we'll be talking about that. The other aspect, and I don't think we have a, no, we're done the slides. Um, the other suggestion in the report on the research is, as some of you know, the CMF developed a little portal uh, called Canada on Screen, which is essentially a promotional tool. So since it's already established and has a lot of TV content on it, we'll be doing an exploration to see if that portal has the possibility to be expanded out into a larger uh, offering for film, television, and digital media. So those are the things we're talking about. Nothing's done, nothing's resolved, but we'll be coming back out to you right across the country to explore some of these ideas and give you something a little more concrete as soon as the two boards of both agencies have had a chance to discuss this and digest it. So that's it, Michael. I did it under three minutes. Perfect. <laughs> um, so the, the stuff, the, the report you got on discoverability, um, a couple of times now I've, I've just heard the, the whole issue of, of digitization, restoration. Is that, is that a really significant uh, undertaking we're looking at? Sure. Yeah, it's large. And I mean, the question there is, and we talked about it a bit, we've talked about it for two years, in addition to the promotion of all the stellar, wonderful success and great content that we have, that Telefilm works on all the time, that you're looking at with your working group, there is this vast library of back catalog. Some of it's available in the world, some of it isn't. So part of the uh, suggestion in the report is to take the premium titles of that, um, content that has had a resonance in the market, has been successful, investigate where the rights are, investigate what the ability to clear those rights or set things up in a way that the content holder would still participate is a big undertaking. Did you want me to tell you how much money? Is that what you're asking? Or? Well, I don't know if I, I but, well, uh, you know, but, uh, if you Kibeta can. With LFA, I started yeah. to do that with French, uh, French film. Mm -hmm. It's a very, uh, very uh, good initiative that they've started. I think that in, in terms of the report, do the thousand titles is about, and it, you know, it's so hard to give a number because it depends if any restoration is required. It depends how complicated the title clearance is. It depends who's got the rights. It depends on what pieces of the rights were cleared for which market. But if you're looking at a body of content of a thousand titles, it's about $3 million. One of the steps in the report is to look at a pilot project. And as I said, we just got it the other yeah. day. So we're still looking at, is this feasible? Is this possible? Where might the money come from? Who might the other partners be? Because it's clear, you know, in these times, even though we seem to be doing really well in the big picture, um, Telefilm's budget has been reduced, and we're certainly working on the picture for the CMF of late. So that level of support financially is not going to come from the two, two agencies federally. But there are others who've expressed interest, and we haven't even gone down that road yet, but we'll be talking How about it. the How the, about the just discoverability? Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things have, uh, you know, different right status, just, just finding some of, these, uh, some of these titles. How big a challenge is that going to be? It could be quite a challenge. As I was saying, Elephant has started uh, this process with the French film, and at first it was quite a challenge to, uh, to deal with the rights and find who were the owners of the rights. And so, yes, it's part of the challenge. And as Valerie was saying, we're, we're still digesting the report, the numbers, and uh, we're going to be investigating uh, what will be the next steps. We have some intelligence from certainly the Elephant Project, certainly the NFB's work that they did on clearance yeah. digitization of rights. Easier because they were partly the producer in that. But also the CBC did a lot of this work when they uh, launched their 75th anniversary around being able to use some of those titles. So in the report, there's a very deep and thorough investigation of that process and what was involved. So we're not going into it blind, mm -hmm. but nobody's pretending it isn't going to be a big job with uh, a lot of moving parts to it. And it's not something, you know, in the, I think in the country we just have to decide is it worth doing or not. And if it is and we want the content available, then I think the approach is start with premium content that resonates in the world, and we've got lots of it, and let's see how we can make that work and then build on it in the future. And then discoverability is obviously the objective, Michael. I think we talked about this over and over again. The more we can get the content into more places, the better and better it gets. I had a meeting yesterday uh, with a man um, 
I guess I better not say who that was. But anyway, his point was, he'd been on Netflix and he was watching a Canadian movie and suddenly they recommended a movie called St. Ralph, which he'd never heard about, was a wonderful piece of content, was Canadian, didn't even know about it, and there it was, and he got to watch it and experience it again. So that's a discover discoverability kind of process. I met the same guy in the bar. Okay. <laughs> oh, I told the same that story everywhere. You can say who did. I wonder if I was talking to you. It wasn't you. <laughs> so, you know, the, one of the things that, that we've discovered on, uh, on the promotional side, when you, when you start looking and, and because there's an assumption here, right, that, that nobody's doing any of this. And, and have you discovered in the stuff you're doing what, what I think we've discovered? Is that there are niches of people and there are some very sophisticated things going on in this country where people have been doing that and they've been doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, I, I'm not sure the right word is isolation, but unknown to a larger crowd of people, many of whom are trying to pursue the same thing. So there's, there's an incredible number of fragmented uh, efforts going on in this country to, to deal with those, the, that whole issue of, um, of discovering access, promotion. Uh, yes, I, sure. I mean, of course, people are doing that. The broadcasters are doing it, you know, in terms of their own content that they invest in. Producers are doing it. It is very fragmented. But I think it's two pieces. I think Canada has a great story to tell. We heard that today at lunch from our own government and from across the, the border, and how we tell that story and can we co tell it collectively in a better way to get a larger piece of audience attention in terms of the multiple offerings that currently exist in this huge environment now that digital offers, this op offers us this opportunity is what we're gonna be talking about. And what are the precise intervention points that we should do or not do? One of the, one of the things uh, I hooked up with you guys a, a while in the, in the fall on the red carpet circuit. I unfortunately didn't get to St. John's, but I remember we did uh, we did Calgary. I thought that was you, you put on an incredible show there. The the turnout in Calgary from the mirror, the civic community, like that that auditorium, which was a big auditorium, was packed with people that that, that came to see the the premiere of, of Midnight Children. It was amazing, actually. Uh, the enthusiasm for, for that, um, you find the same thing in St. John's? Yeah, and uh, we've been doing it here in Ottawa for three years now uh, with the same, uh, the same successes. I think that uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the event that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we do in, with a lot of partners uh, is, uh, has been recognized as one event that you can't miss. So mm -hmm. I think that... Uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's when you do uh, these events, people come, that's for sure. I, I'd like to give the credit a bit back to those communities because yeah. we were maybe a catalyst in that process yeah. and offered some support. But at the end of the day, at the local level, they were the people who drove it and they were the people who really hit mm -hmm. the target. And it was those communities in both centers that actually made that experience that you had happen. Um, I think us bringing the attention to content to them helped certainly drive a, a, bigger, a bigger kind of event in that way, but without what they did locally, it wouldn't have happened. And I just remind you that the critical part of that is public engagement and political engagement at all levels. I'm from Saskatchewan, I'll put it on the table. It doesn't take much misinformation or confusion for something to happen when there's not an understanding about what this sector contributes in each province and territory across this country. So it takes some constant education, building, bringing those decision makers at all levels into the tent to ensure the story's told and told well about the great job that everybody in this room does when you are working wherever you're working from, right from coast to coast to coast. And that's part of the motive of those kind of events, because at least at the federal budget level, those votes happen from politicians across Canada. And it's really important that the story that you have and that we have about the success of the content gets heightened and focused on in those areas. And that certainly happened in Calgary, as you saw. And in, in Newfoundland, we were told they had the largest number of political, not just politicians, but decision makers and deputies and others at the provincial and municipal level that had ever been there in, in that event at that particular festival. Well, that's incredible. And it's not just, it's not just you know, politicians and, 
An, an older generation, uh, you know, talking to the real Canada gang, some of the stuff they've been doing yeah. in the schools has, you know, unleashed a tremendous amount of excitement with the younger generation. Absolutely. And, and the, the other success is also the team work that's behind those, those, uh, those events. Uh, same thing with uh, uh, the NIFCOM. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, really a team, uh, a teamwork, a team effort people working together to make it happen and I think that's that's a real success story yeah, and on the on the MIPCOM you know we've been told we missed a few steps on that and we're yeah. going to correct that and you know it was a one-time event but we don't want to leave it at that I mean Canada had a big big amount of attention paid to huge. it at huge. that huge. international huge. event from the world so now we're investigating how can we um, not you know go big go that big but actually gain, build on what we gained in that market and kind of carry it through on a three-year plan so that that kind of effort isn't lost just because of, you know, we can't be the country of honor every year, obviously. Other countries yeah. want their turn. Well, I don't know, somebody else yeah, was, we buy yeah. it or but I We don't have the money to buy it. Sorry. But I think we can make an impact yes, every absolutely. year and at every event. And it's the repetition of those, those impact that start building uh, the, what we really, we really want, be recognized as a, a very important country uh, that's producing independent content, that's uh, quality independent content. And we widened you know, Canada's presence. I mean, obviously we had a great red carpet event with the talent. Some of, those, some of that talent in our current successful television shows had never been outside of the country. They were overwhelmed with the experience. We brought in Quebecor and Bell spoke in terms of the business agenda and climate in Canada. So it was built out in a number of ways. And I think we had a big hit there, and now we're going to try to maximize that into the future with other partners. And by the way, we had tremendous partners. In the three events, there were 20 partners that contributed just under half a million dollars to that level of activity across the country and internationally. That's awesome when you're, when you're reaching into the community. So we've hit the triple zero thing. Okay. Um, and you know, time to bring out the rest of our panel. Sort of like Survivor. Eh? It's time. Do you want to? Us, are we of, kicked off this island? I, I don't know. I would never kick my uh, <laughs> favorite funders off the island anytime. Uh, that would be, you know, just. Um, I just remind uh, you, it's actually the public and the cable director home subscriber who are the funders. But never mind. Okay. We're the tools. It seems to me. I remember actually saying that when I headed the cable association. But you know. You were on the other side then. They, we're you know, just fighting about different things They now. kidnapped my kid. It wasn't my fault. I just lost um, mine, so it would, be, it would be a nice yeah. thing. Okay, so <laughs> what, I, what I can, yeah, I'd, I'd love you to... Hey, you got a business card of mine? Just if, <laughs> the, if the panel's uh, back there, they, they can come out, because we're going to spend a little time just talking about some ideas about how to promote, because what we want to do... Um, each of you pick one. Each? each? Just take each other's card. Yeah. Well, I'm trying. Where's your card? Where's Carol's card? The one with the barcode on it. <laughs> Got one. Can I read Oops. it? Okay. That's a nice color. Hola, J. Petit. Rich, Richard J. Paradis. <laughs> okay, forget Re those two. Richard wouldn't, he's, he wouldn't know how to use one of those. <laughs> Bad. Carol Brabant. Well, <laughs> that's that's not. I wasn't I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I looked away. You saw me, right? Come on, put it back. No. <laughs> you said you lost yours last yeah, week. I what are you worried about? It was was it fair? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You're all good. You're clear. We love you. <laughs> Have two iPads. Krista Rudowski. Oh. Put it back. No, no? no. Okay. Carol says her has to go back. Give me the box. Okay, I'm going to do it. Carol says her has. Okay, you're going to do it. Fine. All right. Peter Miller. Peter, you here? Yeah, we're gonna, I think you should we're gonna, yeah, Come on. Yep. Jeremy Atherton. Hey, no, come on up. Come on up, we're boring everybody. Fantastic. I love you. Would you like I, a date? I'd love you. I would indeed. <laughs> okay. What time works for you? <laughs> I'll see you at the bar at the Fantastic. comedy. Fantastic. <laughs> Did I say Jeremy Atherton? Were you here? 
<laughs> I'm going to take this if, if somebody, okay. could you just pretend to be the next person that, that calls in, whoever runs up. Edward, Edward Pell. You hear Thank Edward? You. I'll get that slide off the screen and put the digital. I owe, I owe you an iPad after that debate we were having. So. Back, but it won't let me do anything. Oh, there we go. Now, if we could put a tax on this, but if we could put a tax on that. Thank you, Edward. For five minutes. There, that's the one I want. Okay, so one of the, one of the things the, that we did set up was, was a working group um, to look at the whole idea of, of how do we promote our Canadian success stories. So it really wasn't about how do we discover older things, it, although you could talk about older stories, success stories. But the idea was really, you know, if, if we have all kinds of economic success indicators, like you made find and profile, or you have uh, a history of uh, awards of, of um, 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 films that you, know, you could find a telefilm, or similar at the CMF, or rating successes that you get in BBM, or uh, international sales from the, the production industry, or stories of uh, innovation uh, in, the, in the broadcast convergence space. How do you find those stories? How do you get them out? And how do you promote them in a way that, one, excites people about the success, uh, all these successes, and two, actually gets them to say, if they haven't been watching the shows or the movies, to say, I want to I want to watch those. And then we get into issues of discoverability and access. So the first thing that, that, that kind of uh, struck me, um, and it, I'd raised it early this morning, and um, Trish Dolman, um, one of my, my, my favorite members, um, and uh, one of the few <laughs> film producers <laughs> in, in Canada that is willing to not only um, risk doing very independent drama, but also hasn't lost her love of, of documentary. And so one of the questions I asked this morning, and I, I raised this with her before, you know, was at the, at the, at the Screen Awards um, on Sunday night, Rebel won 10 awards. And, you know, and, I, and like I said to people today, it's, it's a fantastic movie. But, you know, it's not that easy to find. Now, with Twitter, people started saying, hey, you can find it on, uh, I think it's on iTunes now, and it's going to be in 30 screens in the U.S., but that's... Pretty lame for Canada. So, so my, my initial question really for um, Trish was, you know, what's the problem we really, we're really trying to solve here when it comes to film? Is it, is it marketing, promotion, discoverability, distribution? Like, where do we, how do we, how do we get to the point where somebody's a, something as incredibly good as Rebel or some of your products are, you know, somebody wants to watch them, they can find them and watch them, but they know about them. They don't get it just out of word of mouth. Well, I, I think, and also what we're doing, that not only do they know about them, which I think is all of the thing, the reasons are behind everything you stated, but also, you know, this group has been tasked with that people also have awareness that they're Canadian. So I think one of the key challenges of being an independent producer is we're not big brands ourselves. We're not Bell. We're not Rogers. Uh, so the shows are the brands, whether, you know, for me it's features and TV and documentaries. So um, it does become an issue of discoverability. And I think there's, uh, you know, as Canadians, especially in conventional media, in, in the press, we don't have a history of really championing our own successes. The coverage of the Oscars is huge on Life of Pi and all different things all different American films and, you know, smaller stories on the Canadian visual effects teams involved in that. But you, know, you saw very little conventional media coverage of Rebel, for example. But I think the CSAs are, gonna, are going to emerge as something really important uh, in the future and, and helping to define the industry. And the fact that we're having these conversations, that this task force and this shows, I think we're going we're gonna to change it. Because in my 18 years in the industry, uh, the quality of what we're doing has completely changed. We're now producing some of the world's best scripted television. We've been, we've been producing some of the world's best unscripted television and lifestyle for a long time. Uh, and so it's a matter of sort of uh, learning to toot our own horn better. But then also, you know, as an indie, the key challenge is reaching our audiences directly. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys all read that Globe and Mail article about Netflix, but 
you know, how do you create awareness to your audience directly about your show, not only through conventional means on, on air or in, in the conventional media, but through social media, et cetera. And it does become an issue of discoverability. And for the only thing I can say for what we do, it becomes about special interest groups with each project. So with feature films, that's often through the cast or through the director and, and leveraging their you know, brand presence on Twitter, on Facebook that exists, or uh, you know, knowledge of the director's previous films, et cetera. But then with factual stuff, we often leverage the relationship of the content to reach those special interest groups. So we did a film about cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis chapters around the world have helped us uh, uh, promote that film. Um, similarly, you know, our recent doc, we're launching it in the US. Um, and it's an environmental documentary, so we're go working with the environmental group who reach over a million people on Facebook through all their different social sites. Then I think coupled with that is how do we let people know that it's Canadian, and that's a key challenge uh, that I think we face. And I don't have the immediate answer. I mean, we have these phone calls about how to address it, and everyone else is going to talk about some of the solutions, but I think that's what, you know, I perceive as an independent is direct access to your audience, which now you can have. That's, and, and that's kind of a very cool segue because we're, we're going to Brad Pillman next, who, Brad, I guess at, at one point, for, you know, Canadian, you were a traditional uh, distributor, Maple, yep. um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, um, got acquired because you're successful in the food chain, I think, by Alliance, got acquired by E1. Et cetera, et cetera. But you're doing some really interesting stuff right now and sort of taking what you know in distribution, turning it on its head and working with Jay, Day, Jay Jolly. That's right. In what uh, Robert Tursek was, was talking about at the world, the world of data analytics. That's right. So, so how, can we, how can we take some of that stuff? Like, tell us how some of that stuff might actually help do what Trish was just saying. Okay, thank you. Um, as, as uh, Trish actually uh, did segue nicely, the, I have spent most of my time in the traditional media distribution landscape. And after the sale of Maple Pictures to Alliance and uh, my gardening period following my stint at Alliance, um, I was able to uh, really take uh, time at 30,000 feet and, and, and have a really good look at what's going on in the Canadian marketplace. And when I met Jay at Banff last year, Banff World Media, um, it was exactly what I think you know we need to be looking at, and that is that is discoverability at the at the earliest outset. So if you haven't been on Cineku.com, which is the website which just launched on Thursday, Feb 28, um, it's basically taking a minimum viable product from now 90 three-person filmmaking teams that we've probably all never heard of, with the exception of Chris Booth in Halifax and Bruce McDonald in Toronto, who both have a project up there. And through the, the curation of trailers to basically you know, do what Hobo with a Shotgun did when Alliance released that, was to at least help to engage the audience at the earliest state before the film is made. So instead of taking a whole lot of risk capital and making a film and hoping that a distributor is going to get passionate behind it, we've gone the other way around. We went to Michael Kennedy first at Cineplex, who guaranteed a theatrical release for the successful film. We cobbled together a million dollars to produce the winning film. We will use this funnel of social engagement over the next uh, you know, 10 to 12 weeks so that at the point of Banff this year in June, we'll, we'll sit up there in a ballroom with the five finalists who have curated their audience through their social media, and we will award them based on their last final pitch, their last desperate attempt to get their film made, um, and we'll award the, the winner with a million bucks. Cineku at the same time will option the other nine projects that have made it through the funnel, and I will then in turn be able to package them in a traditional manner uh, on behalf of you know, the filmmaking teams, take them to regular distribution internationally, and all of the social media that we scrape from the participants uh, is, is in the back room of what Cineku is, which is basically a digital marketing agency focused on big data. And that's, that's the, the basics of it. I can share with you the first three days of data, and they're pretty, pretty staggering. We had 100,000 total views in three days of the trailers. We had 3,000 signups, 2,000 plus signups through Facebook. We had 1,000 email signups, um, and we had 300 in the first hour. On top of that, 
85% of the views were from Canada, 15% were from elsewhere. And all, tomorrow at my other panel, where Jay Jolly and I will actually be on a panel with Catherine Tate and Scott Henderson, we'll actually have seven day data, so I'll be able to update those numbers tomorrow. That's pretty awesome. Now, how many people uh, in the room are, are aware of uh, and, and tracking the CineCoop project? Wow, pretty good. that's, good. that's wow. pretty good. Well, thank you very that's, much. That's, that's, that's pretty good. You know, that's kind of an affirmation for something we've been banging around for, for quite a while on, on the working group. Um, and we, we started talking about, we can't afford the whole P&A thing the, the big American industry uh, does. We have all kinds of problems, as, as, as you know, with, with distribution. Um, and yet, and like we said, we, we've been punching above our weight. So we started talking about how can we get into the, the social media game? And by that, we were sort of saying, what if we could get ACTRA? to really start building out success stories that, that, about their actors so that we can create a star system? What if we could do the same with, with the Writers Guild? And as we said, with, with Carol in terms of the awards, Valerie in terms of uh, the success of Canadian shows, our broadcast friends in terms of uh, BBM data. Like, what if we could use social media at a grassroots level, which means, by the way, just to be clear, this working group is, is really an organic thing in process that, that is going to kick something out to anybody that really wants to participate. And we think, the, ultimately, the most important participants in this are going to be the audience that we hope will take a wiki or a website and just run with it without our control because they love Canadian content and they want they want to perpetuate that star system. If, if all it ends up being is something where you know, a working group like us reports back every different conference, although we're all going to Banff, uh, I promise Robert <laughs> Montgomery I'd say that, not just because we're going to Banff, many of us are actually on the board of, of Banff, but because there's a lot of business being done and they have an incredibly good focus on uh, what's happening in the digital media space. But Claude, so we want to pull all this together and I've been struggling with, with, you know, how do we do that just at CMPA, but I'd love to be under the umbrella of the brand that Val won't share with me yet. Um, yet. Right, Val? That's right. Although I lo you know what, I'm really starting to like Watch Canada. Uh, Watch no, Canada it doesn't work in French, right, Carol? I know, yeah. I was going to say that, but, you know. <laughs> We're close, but maybe bound. What about Watch Le Canada? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Give it That's up, why there's an APF take here. Give it up, Michael. You're not going to know. <laughs> okay, so Claude, Claude, let's uh, let's let's get serious for a, a, a second here, and just and just think, how do we? You know, a lot of people said, well, God, how are we ever going to get that information? How are we going to validate it? How do we ensure it's right? Do we have to do all that kind of thing, or or if if I said to you, Claude, I got I got a I got a budget, uh, I want to I want a wiki, and I want it to do that kind of thing. I want it to you know. I want to fill it up with all the financial information, all the, the analytics that we're getting out of things like Sinecu, stuff from broadcasters, stuff from funders, uh, stuff from individual producers and actors and directors and uh, aboriginal producers, the whole ball of wax, the whole Canadian story. Could we build that? And could we build it fast? I think we could build it, yes. It's called the interweb. Um, and. Um, <laughs> It's using pretty um, uh, extremely um, uh, well-installed technology, principally Wikipedia. Um, I, you know, you put me this challenge to look at it, and I, I went and looked at Wikipedia, and I went and did a couple of audits about, you know, how Canadian themes are treated on Wikipedia. So, if you go to Wikipedia and you look, you Canadian television, for example, if you were interested in doing that, let's say, um, there is a very bad entry there. Uh, it's flagged by Wikipedia itself as basically being bad. Uh, and it's asking for people to correct it. Um, and uh, remember, this, this platform, as well as um, much of the web, it's not about copyright. It's about copyleft. And this is particularly about copyleft. It's about basically crowdsourcing uh, facts and correcting them and improving over time. Uh, and it is an extremely powerful platform. Why? Because it uh, solves the problem of what it is to be online. And to be online is to be Googled. If you cannot be Googled, you're not online. And um, I think everyone 
in the room understands that and they know that and all their productions are working to be Googled so that if you're doing dual screen at any particular time and you're a type in Rookie Blue or Splat a lot or what have you, you'll see a Wikipedia entry, you'll see an IMDB entry at the top. Uh, very, very important uh, because it's part of discovering uh, anything you want to go deep on. So how do you put all this stuff together? Um, the, the Canadian filmed entertainment entries in Wikipedia are very poor. The Canadian music entries are extremely rich and extremely good. And that is interesting. Uh, it speaks to the uh, greater brand equity of Canadian music vis-a-vis uh, -vis crowds and audiences and Wikipedians in general and those who want to go off and, and uh, record uh, what um, is being done in the industry and what is being done in the art. Uh, but it can also be improved in filmed entertainment. Uh, there is, for example, a project in Wikipedia, a wiki group that is responsible for making Canadian music entries accurate. And they run a Canadian music portal. Uh, it's easy to do the same thing uh, in television. And you just start doing it, and Wikipedians will come. Uh, you do have to have a little bit of process around it and a little bit of movement to have it done, but it can be done. And it can be done, I think, out of the existing infrastructure, uh, communications infrastructures of uh, certainly many of the uh, associations, but certainly some of the funding agencies. But obviously, I, I guarantee you that crowds And maybe a little kickstart contributions just to Kickstart contributions. Keep the, thing the other thing I wanted to say, though, is having to do with um, um, uh, Twitter and, um, and television and, and film. I mean, clearly, Twitter is a, the, uh, the most used second screen uh, um, a platform um, um, for live events. And we have an extremely strong calendar of live events, whether it be the Screen Awards, whether it be the film festivals, and so on. And I think the, um, the, uh, the, the PR groups around these festivals are increasingly doing live live tweeting, and, and leveraging everyone who's there, all the fans of all the talent that is there. And that's important. And that's what Hollywood is doing to try to get the Oscars back into a, a younger demo. They kind of failed with Seth. But anyhow, it's definitely Twitter is a live dual screen medium. And it is a place where people discover other things by word of mouth, as and, well as Facebook. And, and it, one of, one of the, the cool things about Twitter or Facebook is that no individual, um, for the most part, has a really big presence there. But collectively, if you thought about a lot of the groups we've been talking about, and individual producers and stars and everything, we would probably quickly find out that collectively their audience, their reach, goes into the hundreds of thousands. Directly, just their followers, the, the people. And that means, I assume, right, that if you had a, a, a large group of those people collectively uh, working together in a loose affiliation, um, then their actual reach of all the people that follow all the people that they're doing suddenly becomes yeah. humongous. Yeah. Yeah, it's and the, that's, it's the that's where effect. we score the big numbers. It's, right. it's the network effect, yeah. It's the network effect. So I, I'm going to go to Robin, and then I, I'm mm -hmm. going to go to Serge last, not because I don't like Serge, but because Serge has some <laughs> success stories in this thing that I, I think is a good place to end up on. Uh, Serge and I used to have problems in other lines of business, but we're cool now. <laughs> Water under the bridge. <laughs> now he's a friend because Pierre Carl said, didn't it, wasn't Pierre Carl said to you just the other day that he was going to do terms of trade? Uh, Say so? I don't remember him <laughs> telling him that. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, it would be great leadership for the CBC. Um, the, uh, Robin, it's his stage. you know, one of the things we did talk about, because, okay, Sarah's going, oh, you know, great, uh, Twitter campaign, that's cool. Um, somebody said that, but they, you know, they're older than I am in mind anyways. Um, and and I, I really, you know, I believe this. As long as, as long as what I promised at the beginning, and this is not a closed working group, this is about to become open, particularly if you're under 30. That's what we really want. Mm. But, but Robin made a really good point in one of our meetings, and she said, you know, uh, TV is still where it's at. TV is still the big screen. TV, if you can hit somebody with something promotional and good on TV, you're going to have 
tremendous effect, particularly if what your goal is is to get people to watch film and television on TV. And film is, you know, the number one place you watch film, is, is, as you said right at the beginning here, is on TV. So Robin, like, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's more complicated because it starts to become costly and, yes. you know, you need a lot of serious business people cooperating to make all this stuff happen. Mm -hmm. But I thought you had some really good ideas at the Canadian Screen Awards, so I wanted you to share some of them with well, us. Uh, I'll, uh, we've all talked about the Screen Awards in one form or another. Um, I just want to You're sort on of the board, aren't you? So you're uh, another one of the yes, people that is I actually am. responsible. So Robin Mursky Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. No, like it was great. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry, I sidetracked. So um, I just want to say that the Screen Awards were a huge success. Our numbers over last year were up 76%. We had something called the Fan Zone, where all the broadcasters got together, brought their cast from their various shows to sign autographs. We had to turn hundreds of people away. And we also had the general public sign up for free tickets to the show on Sunday night, and we had over 1,000 people there. So I think the time is right. Uh, I think Canadians want a star system. They want to, um, um, you, you know, they, they want to support their own, and I think the timing is, is right. So having said that, I, I think that the most passive way that a viewer can be educated is really through television. It doesn't require a search. It doesn't require a wiki page. It's, it's sort of the first step and it gets somebody engaged and somebody interested. So what I have started to do at, at, at Rogers is, you know, it's sort of twofold. Um, you know, we're sort of the best kept secret in the company, which is my funding, um, um, uh, my funding sources, where we have spent over $400 million in the last number of years on Canadian independent production. Most people don't know that, especially the people general in public. the independent production <laughs> sector do. You know, you, the the it's always called Phil's party. It's really Robin's yeah, party at Banff. No. But uh, um, you know, I probably met more independent producers before I actually joined the association at, at years. So yeah, no, we we love the Rogers Fund. You're great. Thank you. So uh, so having said that, um, there's it's there's two things. As Trish said, educating Canadians. Canadians as to what is Canadian, I think, is extremely important. And I've been saying this for a long time. Uh, if you ask people on the street, you know, is Rookie Blue Canadian, is Income Property Canadian, um, uh, is Property Brothers Canadian, most people wouldn't know. And I think it's very, very, very important that the shows that Canadians love to watch are indeed Canadian. So I think it's twofold. You want to educate the public as to what is what they're watching and what they tune into regularly are Canadian shows. Um, and I think, you know, you also want to publicize these shows, and if they haven't watched something, maybe they will watch something. So what I'm doing at my, at my company is we're going to produce a series of PSAs. Our, you know, we have, we have um, sort of a dual um, uh, reason here. One is to educate uh, cable subscribers that Rogers is spending all this money, this is what we're doing. We're going to carry them on local avails and on the Rogers media outlets. So number one, it, it shows the Canadian public that you know Rogers putting its money where its mouth is and supporting Canadian shows. But also, I think it's equally as important to educate the Canadian public on exactly what they're watching is Canadian. Uh, it's quality, it's good. I think people's impression of what Canadian television is and feature film is, is antiquated. And I think people would be surprised that the shows they love are in fact made in Canada. So that's the plan. Do you mind if I add something? I, I don't want to take yeah, no, no, go ahead. away from the search, but it's really interesting because um, this is happening on all levels across Canada. So we just had a, a roundtable meeting in Vancouver with the mayor of Vancouver. As many of you may have heard, there's been a big uh, public campaign about the decline in service production in British Columbia and its impact. So the mayor, who's very progressive, called a roundtable meeting of about 30 people. And what we talked about was the brand of Vancouver and how we've done a really crappy job of promoting to the public the value of cre not only the film and television industry, but the creative industries in general. Because that is one of the top three, there's the three major industries that, that are the economic engine behind the city of Vancouver. So we talked about many of these same things, like promoting Vancouver to Vancouverites. So I think now the key challenge is you're doing this, you're doing that, is we all have to work together so there's not all these things cropping up on different platforms, or we, we need to do it collectively so there's a big 
promotional burst at the same time. You know, we've got and to we're harness just, it And we're all. just the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, real Canada wow, out there is doing oh, in, yeah. incredible stuff. So we do have to work together because a lot of people have invented a lot of mousetraps already. And one of the places where we've probably seen more success with the star, the star system in Canadian shows uh, is in Quebec. And you might notice that pretty much everyone here right now is from the English language market, because we started off from the premise that, you know, Quebec's a winner, we're losers, relatively speaking. When it comes to, when it comes to just people knowing, you know, when people knowing, because the, the most amazing thing, like I knew there was some good stuff when I, when I took over this job, but I was blown away once, you know, I forced myself to start watching it. And like I was going, hey, shit, I love this. This is great. Well, yeah, you know, because you go, hey, okay, you know, I got the job. I'm going to stop. It was like this. I'm going to stop watching these U.S. shows I like, and I'm going to start. I'm going to watch Continuum. And wow, I watch it all the time. Mr. D, mm -hmm. great stuff. I meant it like that. I meant it in a really nice okay. sense. Okay. <laughs> It was not, it was not painful like, you know, people were telling me, you know, it was great. It's a great experience. It's fucking great. I love it. I promised before the end of the day I was going to get that out before Val. Um, so, Serge, Serge, we're stripping, it's a typical thing, right? You know, like, we'd like to hear from Quebec, so and then everybody has a conversation in English. Um, Serge, fire away. Thanks, Michael. Um, coming from a Quebec-based company, I do indeed uh, uh, bring a different perspective to the question of the popularity of Canadian and especially Quebec uh, content. Uh, in television, at least, there is uh, no question about the popularity of uh, Quebec content. Unless uh, there is a big uh, TV event like the Super Bowl or the Oscars, the top 30 most popular shows are uh, always Quebec shows. Uh, several shows regularly score over a million viewers. Some even get two to 2.5 million viewers. Uh, TVA's version of uh, The Voice, La Voix, even did uh, over 2.8 million viewers in February, a 60% market share in Quebec. All this in a market of 8 million people. Um, as exemplified by La Voix and other uh, popular shows like Star Academy, Le Banquier, or Tout le monde en parle, uh, the issue with Quebec TV uh, right now is not that people are not aware uh, of it or are not watching it, uh, but rather that it relies so heavily on concepts uh, imported uh, from abroad. As a company, we would rather see Quebec concepts be exported abroad rather than the reverse. Uh, for this to happen, though, uh, some uh, discriminatory rules regarding tax credits would have to be modified since shows uh, produced by TV networks are not uh, eligible to receive provincial tax credits in Quebec. In movies, on the other hand, we have kind of the opposite problem. Our movies do well abroad, uh, at least in terms of winning prizes and critical acclaim, as we witnessed at the last Oscars when both uh, Rebel and uh, Henry garnered the nominations. The problem is that locally, audiences seem to have uh, tuned off Quebec uh, and Canadian movies, at least in the theaters. Last year, out of the 20 most uh, popular movies at the box office, only one film, Omerta, was from Quebec. Year on year, Quebec films were down more than 50% compared to 2011, getting less than 5% market share, a far cry from the 18% market share of 2005. As a media company that buys shows and until recently distributed Quebec and Canadian movies, this situation both sudden uh, and alarms are us, and we have been very vocal on this issue. This is because uh, Quebec cinema is something uh, Quebecor and its CEO, Pierre Carl Pelado, are very passionate about. Uh, it may in fact surprise you to learn that the only TV show dedicated entirely to Quebec cinema and television, called Première Vue, is not broadcast on Radio Canada, Télé Québec, or RTV, but rather, uh, rather on uh, one of our channels, MaTV. But uh, nothing is, exemplifies our efforts to promote uh, Quebec cinema better than a project that we started in 2007 called Elephant Mémoire du Cinéma Québécois. Elephant, with, which certainly qualifies as a best uh, practice, is a philanthropic initiative of uh, Pierre Carl Pilado that aims at restoring, digitizing, and making available every feature film ever produced by uh, Quebec filmmakers. To date, 
uh, over 200,000 films have been restored and made available to Video Trans VOD service. 200,000? Hmm? Did you say 200,000? No, 2,000 2, films. 2,000. Uh, no, excuse me, 200 films. 200 films. Yeah. 200. Yeah. What did I say? You, you, it sounded like 200,000. You're just bragging. No, no, 200 again. films. Sorry. You're just bragging. 200 <laughs> films. Well, Your numbers no, really. are so good, we'll believe anything you say. Exactly. No, no. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. You're welcome. 200 films. 200 films. <laughs> so I've been restored and uh, made available to uh, Video Trans VOD service. Uh, with its website, elephant.canoe.ca, Elephant uh, also aims to be the reference point for Quebec cinema old and new, uh, acting as a local IMDB, giving detailed cast, plot, and other technical information about every Quebec movie that comes out, including stills and trailers. So far, uh, Quebecor has poured uh, over $2.5 million in this uh, project, and uh, we don't intend to stop until uh, every Quebec feature film from the mundane to the masterpiece has been saved, restored, and uh, made available. This is because making Quebec and Canadian cultural content easily accessible to everyone is one of our priorities at Quebecor. This is what uh, has also inspired us to launch uh, our streaming music service, Zik.ca, last year. Zik is the largest francophone music streaming site in the world, giving Quebec and Canadian music a showcase that is unrivaled uh, by any other commercial music streaming service. And it is also a showcase for Canadian television, as performances from uh, La Voix contestants are made available on ZIC every week, where they currently occupy the first five spots of the, on uh, the list of the most listened to songs on the service. It is that same desire to make Canadian content accessible uh, on all platforms in the most convenient fashion that has uh, prompted us to launch, uh, like uh, Valerie said, Videotron's new Illico Club Unlimited. An alternative to Netflix, it offers the largest and most regularly updated selection of French language movies and shows uh, uh, of any such uh, service in Canada. This service is meant as a complement to our VOD service, which already offers the most extensive Canadian content catalog of any Canadian BDU. Although frequently overlooked, uh, and I already said that at the IIC uh, symposium, VOD is often, is often the most convenient way for Canadians to access Canadian content, uh, such as smaller movies that are only released in few urban centers. But of course, making uh, Canadian movies accessible as they are currently, does not necessarily mean that Canadians will know uh, to look for them and then actually sit down and watch them. Uh, awareness is still a big issue in both Quebec and uh, Canada. This is why the kind of branding and promotion efforts uh, currently being discussed by our working group uh, are so essential to uh, ensuring that uh, Canadian content is not only available but enjoyed by uh, as many Canadians as possible want to make a, a comment on, on your numbers. Our, our films, our Canadian films, are not just appreciated in festivals around the world. The, they, are so, they are also uh, selling well. Uh, and between 2010 and 2011, the international sales have, mo have almost tripled, uh, going from 21 million to close to 60 million. So I think that uh, they're, they're doing well on the international sales as well. And that's a myth that it's only good in the festival. So that's why I, I felt that I needed to, to say it. No, no, that, that's not what I was saying. I no, was no, saying I know. that but in I, Quebec, yeah. we, we, we had over the, the past few years problems well, with getting Qu yeah. Quebecers into theaters. Mm -hmm. so, so some of your no numbers are, are really incredible. And, and that's why we're, you know, we're branching out to, to really um, um, get, you know, the, the Quebec side involved because there's such incredible success there. But I think also, as Claude had said in one of our calls, right, when we start to launch something completely new in the social media space, there are tools that we hope that a younger generation is ultimately going to create out of, you know, uh, a few ideas we have into something that's incredible. And it will, it doesn't matter what language it is in at that point, I suspect. So we have one, uh, that's, that's kind of it for our panel, it's short. And I, I, you know, I kept saying about inclusion. Uh, what we're really looking to do, at least on the social media side, uh, to the next step, and, and Robin's created more of a, a broadcast committee to look at, at how you, uh, you deal with uh, the ad space on, on television. 
But on, on the social media side, um, and I'll start blogging a little bit, we're, we're, gonna, we're looking for people that are doing things. So, you know, we've talked to the real strain uh, um, people. We've been looking at uh, a lot of the sources of news in this country from, you know, Toronto film scene to TVA to, uh, uh, that's TVA, um, uh, Press Plus One. No, it is TVA. If you haven't, if you haven't read it online, it's, it's quite good. Uh, there are a lot of people that are out promoting. Um, and, uh, you know, they have, to be, they have to be part of this. Because we want, at the end of this process, uh, as, as we head, in, you know, head into Banff, is really to hand this over uh, to people that show the most passion about this. It's not ours, we don't own it, it's not, you know, we're not gonna score brawny points by being on the Telefilm CMF working group. This is going to be something that okay. we're talking about <laughs> kickstarting. Um, and that really means, you know, trusting, you know, if you're gonna believe in audience engagement, you're gonna trust, you have to keep handing things down the line to the people that count the audience, the consumers are doing this. So I have, a, as, as the panel gets ready to leave, I just want to say we got one last uh, session, and there's going to be some uh, pretty interesting research, I think, Val, coming out of uh, what uh, Catalina Brienko, uh, who's the Director of Industry and Marketing Trends at the Canadi Canadian Media Fund, um, they're launching a, um, this, something called the Second Screen in Television. The benefits and impact, and this is the, the second paper you've done on the, the second screen, correct? Yes, don't ask me, ask those guys up. Yeah, okay. Catalina will tell you. Michael, just one, is Bruce Harvey in the audience anywhere? Okay, well, I'll just, at the reception last night, I didn't know this. We got talking about the Screen Awards and who cares and the media around them. And he said to me, well, didn't you get your iTunes notice? And I said, no, what do you mean? Oh, I got an iTunes notice about all the winners on the Canada Screen Awards. And he pulled up his BlackBerry and he clicked on it and you hit a button and there they all were. Every winner in all the categories on iTunes. Yeah. You, know that, great. you know that iTunes actually was the one place I found in the, the Canadian ecosystem that actually was, they had as many of the uh, nominees up on, they had a thing called you know, yeah. Canadian yeah. Screen Awards, where you could click on it and watch a lot of the uh, the nominees uh, on iTunes. It was it was pretty cool on iTunes. Okay, that's, I mean that's cool and uh, you know good for them doing it. And you sort of go, well, fuck, shame on us. See? Well, that's my point. I'm, I'm that's two, my point. It's two to nothing, Hennessy versus <laughs> Val. You know, but Val, I think yeah, I yeah. Well, we go to the bar. You don't drink. I do. I think we'll even the score. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it Val, I got to kick you off the stage. If you sort of lead, then your team can come up and tell I think us it's about Catalina, the. Yes. I, I sure hope she's here. Are we leaving? <laughs> yeah, we all have to go. Okay. We have to go. But but stay tuned because this second screen stuff is going to be very interesting. Is the clicker? Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Are you like me? Have you been enjoying this first day as much as I did? Great. Oh boy, thank you. Thank you, CMPA, where you've been putting together a great event. I can't see you very well. I'm pretty sure actually I know many of you in that room, but um, just out of curiosity, and please be honest about this, raise your hands. Before you saw my name on that program, who knows me? That's it? Darn. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course, because it's not about me. But this actually reflects a little bit what we actually all know about CMF. So everybody knows about our funding mandate, right? Which is totally OK, because that's our primary mission. But the reality is that we do cover a wider range of strategic actions. One of them, of course, and, um, is promoting Canadian content on global markets. And that, of course, was very clearly uh, and widely uh, discussed um, during the, the previous presentation. The third one is about fostering and developing the industry. 
And this is where, although fairly uh, recently or fairly new, the industry uh, and market trends department steps in. So our role is to collect, analyze, and disseminate back to the industry um, up-to-date uh, information, information that is meaningful to our stakeholders, information about market developments and overall evolution of the television and the digital media industries. Now, so how do we do that? We do that uh, through different communication channels. One of them is our Transcape blog, Twitter feeds, conferences, and also uh, through several and very committed research partnerships. Now, last year, we've entered in 14 of those research collaborations, and so far we have released nine publications on different topics uh, uh, through the CMF website. So one of those partnerships is with a firm called Evolu Media. And I think Gilbert Ouellet, CEO and founder of Evolu Media, is here. Say hello. <laughs> so, um, and I think uh, they said a word about that. So CMF and Evolu Media have been co-publishing co a series of three white papers uh, on second screens and television. The first report was released in October, and today it is my pleasure uh, to announce that we're releasing the second report that is called Benefits and Impacts. So why do we want to investigate on second screen and social TV on the first place? Well, because things are still changing. And among those things, uh, content consumption habits and behaviors are still evolving. We knew already, right, that the audiences wanted to access the content anytime and anywhere. But Saul Berman from IBM actually captures two new characteristics that we cannot ignore anymore. So beyond being on demand and on the run, the consumption of content is also social and distracted. Multitasking in front of television is happening and is often happening to the profit of other activities that are not related to the TV uh, viewing experiences. Now, this multitasking is also um, uh, highly influenced, or greatly influenced, shall I say, uh, by the proliferation, proliferation, that's my French, see how a French person say proliferation in English? So, uh, uh, by uh, personal connected devices. Um, we know already that everyone in Canada, almost 96% of Canadians own TV sets and a vast majority also have access to personal um, computers, but very recent data from MTM actually shows that 26% of Canadians now have a connect connected tablet and 62%, and this is uh, very uh, recent from Comscore, 62% uh, of cell phone owners own smartphones in Canada. So in such a context, second screens and social TV, uh, second screen strategy seems like an adapted response to this multi-screen uh, environment because they address these new characteristics, also because they create this unprecedented opportunity to synchronize television programming with related and engaging companion activities. Now, this is a great news because it means that there are some ways of dealing with the scattered attention of the multitasking viewers. However, to create this, these new relationships, to reinvent these new relationships with the audiences, uh, we have to better understand uh, th those, th the audience's behaviors, uh, starting with the fact that there is no such thing as a singular and undifferentiated TV audience anymore. So, and I'm not talking about just segmenting viewership or audience uh, uh, by demographics, but actually start segmenting also based on their level of interaction and engagement to the content. It is true uh, most of television viewers still want uh, from that uh, television experience to be a lean back uh, experience and approach. And they're passive and they want to remain like that. But there's a growing proportion as well of uh, audience members that are willing to become active users. And there's now those who wants to go even further and truly participate and interact with the content as well as with other audience members as they are watching their favorite TV show. So 
This, um, I'm going to take a... This new white paper that we're releasing today actually goes deeper into the subject and analyze the benefits and potential impacts of launching a second screen strategy related to a TV program. Now, the benefits presented in the study are associated with the concept of discovery, audience loyalty, and monetization. Because I have very little time with you today, I won't be able to delve in details in each of those, but know that in the study, not only are these benefits explained, but they're illustrated with plenty of data and, and more importantly, with plenty of recent example. That being said, I'm gonna spend a moment on monetization because I don't think I'm wrong if I say that this is a topic of interest to many of us. So, uh, there are some ways to uh, take profit and monetize a second screen strategy. To my knowledge, there's no experience so far of monetizing in a direct manner the second screen application or the campaign activities. We can assume that it's because it's still a nascent and novelty uh, approach and therefore that the focus is really on developing new habits and on encouraging um, user and, ado and audience's adoption rather than creating a, a barrier to entry. Uh, nonetheless, there are some uh, revenue generation experiences that are going on out there. Now, you won't be surprised if I tell you that the first one is related to advertising. So, dedicated application, website, uh, websites, Facebook pages, Twitter feeds are, of course, all great windows uh, to expand the visibility of advertisers and brands that are also seen on television. But beyond just uh, creating more value uh, uh, for the media placement, there are also some uh, inventive way to use advertising or second screen strategies uh, and advertisers. So I want to give you this example. Uh, this is about a Canadian company called Mobile Vivo, who partner with a leading uh, TV network in Brazil, Global TV. And they decided to deploy a second screen strategy for a new uh, telenovela that, that was uh, for first time introduced in television that was called Suburbia. Now, the interesting thing is that they didn't use the second screen strategies uh, to actually activate anything during the TV program, but rather to activate during the advertising times. So what happened is that using their cameras on their smartphones, the audience members were able to take pictures of the ads on television or on newspapers and send that back to the broadcasters, automatically triggering bonus material, videos, pictures, giveaway songs. Well, the response, uh, and that was done uh, obviously, you know, before the launch of the series, and the response was amazing. And here, I just want to use uh, the words uh, of uh, Trevor Dokson himself, which is the CEO of maybe Mobile Vivo, on this, on this uh, experience. So, more than 100,000 viewers sent in pictures, the show launched with an impressive audience share, and the viewers knew more about the characters. I guess this is what made it better TV. They fell in love with one of the songs, they shared that, they shared their whole experience with their friends, and they felt invested in the show. Just for your information, this testimonial and ma many other um, uh, case studies are shown on a website that is called Innovate TV, which is an industry-initiated project uh, that is also supported by CMF. And uh, I'll show you later maybe uh, the address, so if you'd like to see other example of second screen or uh, innovation on that, on that side. So what else can be done? Uh, better, ju ju of course, just increasing the media placement by putting and, and expanding visibility uh, for your advertisers. But this kind of ideas can also be replicated, which are interesting because they actually keep the audience tuned in during the ad times. So another way to monetize is e-commerce, which is also known uh, like television commerce, or also known, and I, I love this expression, shopping-enabled entertainment. Ooh. So this is actually what bridges uh, the interest that is created by the product that is seen on television and the actual action of purchasing that product using a personal connected device. Now, this type of initiative is still very uncommon in Canada. 
Uh, but there are some uh, more and more uh, uh, t-commerce technologies and initiatives that are implemented in Europe and in the US. One example uh, in the United States is the possibility for the FX channel viewers to shop and purchase, uh, purchase men's apparel while they're watching the popular series Sons of Anarchy. Now, let's quickly move on to the impact. Uh, the reports also threw some, some lights on the impact that may occur when a second screen uh, strategy is put into action. Uh, now, the consequences uh, uh, on the production cycle on a TV project are discussed in depth in the study, but just l let's remember for now that uh, from the idea to delivery, additional steps must, must be planned and new contributors such as interactive developers, IT specialists, advertisers, sales team, and even the audience members may be involved all along the creation and production processes. And other impacts are also uh, to be taken in account on different uh, aspects of uh, the production, which are, of course, on the content, on the financing of, of all of these uh, companion activities, on the technology choices uh, and skill sets that will be needed to deploy these strategies, and the operating cycle um, of the whole TV program, because, of course, very often, uh, second screen strategies and social TV activities can be triggered uh, and put in place, you know, preceding the first broadcast and may even survive after uh, the last episode. Now, what we need to remember here uh, for now is that we should, shouldn't consider these observations uh, on benefits and potential impacts uh, as being static and unevolving. Uh, this is completely an emerging uh, uh, phenomenon, and, and, and therefore, you know, uh, new questions uh, may be raised uh, throughout the time, and, and new impacts and new benefits will also be discovered. But the reality is that the real answers will come whenever we're ready and able to truly measure. Um, all of these uh, uh, strategies that are put in place and companion activities surrounding television programs. And, and that needs to be done in a unified approach. And on this end as well, there's a lot of very high level uh, ventures that are happening around the world right now. So Nielsen has actually partnered with Twitter uh, to come up with a kind of unified uh, Twitter TV rate, rating, which is a hybrid measuring uh, that will be launched uh, in the fall of 2013. Here in Canada, we do have a, a company called C-Vibes uh, that is providing what we call the C-Vibes core that is really a pulse of uh, how social TV every day uh, uh, is, is working for networks and for media agencies. So um, it, it provides a, an overall uh, portrait of the, the performance of a, a program uh, using the indicators of the kind of social audience and the social buzz they're creating um, on social media. Now, Twitter TV Book is an initiative that has been implemented, again, by Twitter in the UK. And uh, it's a publication that is offered through subscription to broadcasters and British advertisers. It gives details information about audience behavior during each English TV program according to demographic, devices, and genres. And finally, in France, uh, they have uh, the, the, um, the network TF1 last January actually uh, stated that its market share uh, should now be considered as the combination of its television and social media audiences. And this actually for them warranted the creation of MyTF1 Connect, which is an application, an umbrella application, that is integrating all of their second screen initiative to their programming. So moving um, rapidly to the conclusion because I'm uh, almost done with my time, I will tell you this, during the last um, consumer electronic uh, show, CAES, that happened in January, was held in January in the United States, they released this big, chunky, 250 pages economic analysis about second screens and social TV emerging markets. Now, this market is estimated right now at $490 million in the United States and is expected to grow to $5.9 billion by the end of 2017, which makes it quite an interesting and serious marketplace. My views is that 
there is no one that is better positioned than television creators, television executives, to embrace this opportunity in this emerging market. Content producers and broadcasters, they can really step into the space by stimulating the multitaskers, um, by offering you know, synchronized and very integrated, compelling companion activities. They're very well positioned to activate all of those viewers' devices making a good use and a good understanding of technology of, or what Robert Turchek this morning called uh, the software layer. So they're able to do that by better understanding and, and creating that layer in a meaningful way and creating that loop. And they need to build and measure that feedback loop between the companion activities and the television space. Now, by doing that, I truly, truly believe that TV industry is in a unique position to foster audience engagement and loyalty and to set the ground to new monetization models. Now, this is not the end. I'm not going to sing that song, but <laughs> a lot of singing today. So this is not the end because I actually now want you to go on the website and get your copy of the second uh, report. And for those who didn't raise their hands at the beginning of the presentation, I think there's a cocktail right after. So let's take this opportunity to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Catalina, thank you. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's great work. Um, that, that, that's the kind of important stuff uh, that I'm glad to see people doing because it, it validates uh, it, oh, I was close. Uh, it validates a lot of the ideas of what we're doing. I mean, there's nothing better than putting metrics around it. Um, somebody mentioned alcohol. Um, and our, our friends at uh, the Directors Guild of Canada um, are actually hosting um, it, it is immediately outside this room and not on the other side. They're hosting a cocktail reception so we can all uh, mingle. So that's, that's number one. That should keep you busy till, till uh, dinner. Um, but later tonight, uh, come and join us back in the room for a show called License to Laugh. It's a night of comedy. Uh, the door is open at 9. show begins at 10 with MC Sean Cullen, comedian Rebecca Kohler, and Mark Forward. Uh, I hope today you had a really great conference. Um, it, it, Open mic? Open bar. Oh. Open bar, that's, you know, well, I thought people, I thought, you know, our star system was working and people would have been, hey, I want to go see those guys. But yes, and an open bar. Thank you. And does the bar open at 9? The bar opens at 9, shows at 10. So you should be, bring some rolls. Bring some rolls from lunch. Anyways, you've been a great audience of people that stayed all the way. Super. I hope, I hope we really uh, added value today. I know that there was an incredible amount of value added, not only by uh, the CMPA team that actually makes this, this, this show work every year and makes it work better this year, but the people, the volunteers, the people that sat on panels, uh, I've, I've really been incredibly impressed, and I, and I, I thank them so much for uh, coming and joining us and making this a good first day. Thank you very much.